In this video, you'll be creating this fighter pilot challenge game using the HTML5 canvas. So I've, as you can see, I've started the game. You start the game by dragging down on this red square to move it around. And then now the blue rectangles will start moving around and they'll bounce off the edge of the canvas. And this border, this black border stops us from going off the edge of the canvas. So if we touch the black border, then yeah, as you can see, the game's over. And also the game will also be over if we fail, fail to avoid these blue rectangles as well and as you can see it shows us the time that we survived for uh, this is based off of the this website here this semi famous game apparently it's what the US Air Force actually used but I doubt it it's probably just some gimmick and the, the difference between my version which in my opinion is better and their version is that theirs is not made using the HTML canvas theirs is made using HTML tables which is the reason why when you actually play on it, again, it works in the same way, but theirs is more stuttery. So if you look at these blue squares, sorry, these blue rectangles, as you can see, they're moving about, more, they're more staggered in their movement. Um, and it's also more obvious when they eventually speed up. Now, my rectangles also speed up, but it's just less obvious because the canvas repaints itself extremely quickly. However, these table aids, there's gaps in between the movement, which is the reason why they're staggering. So this video is a good video if you want to learn how to make an extremely basic canvas game. Maybe you don't know a lot about canvas and you want to learn how to do uh, basic physics and collision detection, then this will be the perfect video for you. So keep watching and find out how to make this. Okay, so I've just launched VS Code in a new root project folder, but you can use whatever source code editor that you want. First thing that we will do is we will use, we'll create the markup file, we'll call it index.html, and in VS Code use an exclamation mark to create the HTML boilerplate code. We'll change the title to Fighter Pilot Challenge, and then below this, but still inside the head, we will write out a link tag to link to the style sheet which we're going to create and it's well as I said before it, it's going to be a style sheet and it needs a href to actually link to a file we'll call it style.css now we will open up the body and we'll create a comment so we know that the script tag is below and then we need to create that script tag we only need one and we will use the source attribute and we will link to we'll call it script.js and we'll need two more elements or nodes inside of the body. The first one will be this header and it will mirror the header of the document. We'll just call it fighter pilot challenge. And then below this, we'll create the all important canvas element and it will have three attributes. The first one is width and height. Now we don't specify units for these 600 numbers because it's pixels by default. And then the last one will be ID, and that will be canvas. So we can style this canvas element easily, and also link to it in the JavaScript file. So now we'll need to create the style sheet, so we'll call it style.css. And the first thing that we will do in this element, we will open up the style like that. So this will target all elements for styling, and we'll set all the elements box sizing to border box. So include the margin and padding in the final width and height values. And then below this, we'll change the font family of all the elements and we'll change it to this nice sans serif font sequence. And then below that, we'll style the body and the background color will be a nice gray color. So that will be, its hex value will be E6, E6, E6. And then below that, we'll change the color, the text color of all the body elements to black and We'll set the display of the body to be flex, and we want it to be a flex column. So we'll say flex direction column. And then below that, we'll set the min height to be 100 viewing height, because the body is currently 100% the width of the document, but it has no height value to it. And because we want to center all our elements of the body horizontally and vertically, we want the body to be at least 100% the width of the document. And then we use these two properties here to actually center the body elements, both horizontally and vertically. So justify content in this case will be 
the vertical centering because it's flex direction column and the align items property will be the horizontal alignments because it's flex direction column and then we'll also set the margin to be zero so you remove the browser's margin that it adds to the padding and the final element that we'll style is the canvas and remember we gave it that canvas id and then we'll set the background color we'll set it to be the header text value will be f0 times by three times now this is all we need for the styling and just so you know what it looks like we'll open up the markup file and live server which is a vs code extension by the way and as you can see this is what it looks like and there's no border on the canvas yet because that isn't actually made with HTML elements. That's made by actually drawing the rectangle onto the canvas. So we'll start the, with the style sheet now. So I'm not the style sheet, the JavaScript file, and we call it script.js. The first thing that we'll do in this JavaScript file, we'll create a reference to the canvas. So we'll say document.get element by ID, and then we'll target the canvas like so. Below this, we will extract the context on the canvas. So we'll say const ctx, which is the typical naming convention that people call their context from the canvas. And then to extract it, we use the get context method and we want to extract 2D. Once we've done this, we will create an object that will hold values for the red rectangle that the user interacts with in their cursor and they can move it around. Its X offset will be 275, meaning that the left edge of the rectangle is positioned 275 pixels away from the left edge of the canvas. And its Y offset will also be the same, 275. Now that's the same for the top edge of the rectangle and the top edge of the canvas. It's offset by 275 pixels. And because it's a square, it will have width of 50 pixels and height also of 50 pixels. Now, creating these values here isn't going to add anything to the canvas. To actually use these values to draw graphics onto the canvas, we're going to create a new function. And a way to comment, we'll say render rectangles to canvas. And then we'll say function draw rect. Is that, that's what we'll call the function. And then I'll write a new comment inside because there's going to be some more content inside this function later on. We'll say draw player rect first and then we'll use the context and the fill rect method on that. And we'll say player rect dot x player rect dot y because this method is first two arguments for the x and y coordinate of the specific element that we want to draw. And then it's other two Arguments will be the width of the element that you want to draw and the height, which is the reason why we use playerec.width and height, like so. Now we want to give this rectangle color, that red color that I talked about before. So above we'll say context, fill style, and we'll set it to be, it's gonna be a hex value, and we'll say 991234, so four zeros. So obviously this method needs to be called because there's no point creating it if it's not going to be called. So what we'll do, we will create a new function called update. And this update function is very important because it will be called on each canvas frame, allowing the canvas to be animated. And so that's the reason why the first thing that we do in the update function is we'll, we will use the clear rect method to clear the contents of the canvas on the previous frame, allowing it to be animated. We want it to take up the entire width and height of the canvas to clear absolutely everything. And once that we've done this, we will call that draw X method that we just created. And now actually, yeah, so we need to use this request animation frame method, which comes from the canvas API and we'll call the update method, which we're inside. And so now this update method will be called on each canvas frame, allowing elements to be animated, but obviously it won't be animated yet because this doesn't actually move. But again, this update method hasn't been called, so we'll need to call it once. And then once we call it once, because this method gets called here, so then now the update method will just be called on its own, each canvas frame. So below we'll say call, uh, call update method on 
initial document load and then we'll just call it like so and now if we go back to our live server as you can see this red square has been painted to the canvas now remember at the start you saw the canvas had a black border around the perimeter of the square so we'll need to create a function so we can actually give the canvas this rectangle on each canvas re-render frame so we'll create a new comment actually we'll do it above the draw rectangle and we'll do it above the player rect actually we'll say canvas black border and then we'll say function draw border and we'll open that up like so we'll say ctx dot fill style equals black because you want it to be black and then we'll say ctx dot fill rectangle and we will set its x offset x and y offset to both be zero and then we will say the canvas width as the width and then the canvas height as its height but currently this will cover the entire canvas and we don't want that you want it to be a border and we don't want it to cover the entire canvas because all this will do at the moment is just make the entire canvas black um, so we will say ctx dot clear rect and we will clear out 50 we'll start its top left corner will be 50 pixels inset from the canvas both horizontally and vertically and then we will say span for 500 it will leave basically a 50 pixels gap all around the square essentially meaning that this black rectangle it's only 50 pixels wide on all different edges so now we will need to call this method inside this update function so we will say draw border like so and now if you go back to our live server we should see the border as you can see it's been added like so now we'll need to create the other rectangles the ones that actually move around the screen without the user input and they bounce off the edge of the canvas so we'll say game elements and then we'll say let rectangles and it's going to be an array because there's more than one this time an array of objects just like this player rec was so and then we'll say it will also follow a similar format but not entirely so this one this will be the top left rectangle and we'll position it accordingly and we'll have its dx we'll say five and then it's dy will be four whoops you'll see why in a second but basically we want it to travel faster towards the right more than it does travel downwards so basically what this would do it'll be pushed towards the right but at an angle basically and have we'll say width it's, okay this is this one's going to be a perfect square so width 75 and height 75 um and then we'll create the other one so this one will be the top right rectangle and then we'll say actually now we'll give it a color of we'll use a hex value we'll say four zeros and then nine nine like so and that will create the blue color for the other object this one will be it'll be moved further towards the right on the x-axis but in terms of its distance from the top of the canvas that will be the same and then this one you have a dx a minus five this is because we want it moving towards the left which is the reason for the minus number and then the dy for this we'll get it 5.5 this one's a bit more different so it'll actually be moved down more than it will be towards the left so instead of it having a downward angle like that it would actually be a slight curvature like so it'll be a less steep angle is what i'm trying to say and then it's width will be 80 so this one won't be a square it will be a rectangle and then its height will also be 60 and they're all actually gonna have the same color but i included this color property just in case you wanted to change the colors yourself which you might want to do so you can have different rectangles having different colors basically that will have to be the same color it's just extra customization 
and then the x will be 75 so the one that we're creating now is the bottom right rectangle actually no sorry we're creating the bottom left rectangle sorry I just got that wrong but we're creating it anyway again it's a bit difficult because we're not actually able to see what it looks like until we've rendered it out to the canvas and currently we're not even rendering it out to the canvas we're just creating the actual properties that the rectangles need its width will be 40 so again the dx and dy this is the same so it'll actually move at a perfect right angle because it's horizontal it, it's horizontal force and vertical force will be the same and it'll be moved towards the right horizontally and upwards because it's the bottom left rectangle we want it to move in that direction at a uh, like three o'clock no sorry like two o'clock between one o'clock and two o'clock basically that sort of direction and its height will be 80 and then again its color will be the same because in my case all the rectangles have the same color okay there's one square but it doesn't really matter and then its x will be 420 okay so now we are doing the bottom right rectangle which is the final one so its x will be 420 y will be 450 dx will be minus 5 ty will be minus 5 because we want this one moving towards the left and also towards the top again that's a perfect right angle and its width will be 130 and its height will be 25 so this one's quite long but also short in terms of height and then again its color will be the same so now finally we've done all that to render them out we will go back to this draw rect method and we will say rectangles dot for each and then we will say rect will call the each the individual object contained in the array and then we'll say ctx dot fill style equals rect dot color like so and then below that we'll say ctx dot fill rect and then we'll say rect dot x rect dot whoops rect dot y rec dot width rec dot height so now because this function is already called in the update method so now if we go back to our live server as you can see they've been added to the canvas and it's looking good it actually mirrors the eChalk website which I haven't got loaded up at the moment which is kind of a shame. actually I should probably just have it in my history okay I shouldn't probably be showing that actually never mind Okay, so if you remember, the game starts when the user clicks on the red square and to actually detect if the user is clicking inside of the red square and not just anywhere else on the canvas, we'll need to create a function and we will say returns true if collision. Actually, no, we'll say if user, if mouse is in rectangle in a player rectangle and then we'll say function is cursor in rect and it will take a three arguments x y and rect and then we'll say return open up a parentheses we'll say so if x is greater than rect dot x so in other words, if the x coordinate of the mouse is greater than the left edge of the rectangle, then obviously, well, I mean, it could either be inside or it could be towards the right of the right edge of the rectangle, which is the reason why we say and, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, we don't use a comma there, we say and x is less than rect dot x plus rect dot width. So now it can't be past the actual rectangle itself because if it's less than the right edge of the rectangle, we work out the right edge of the rectangle by getting the x offset of the rectangle and then adding whatever its width value. So it can either be inside, in terms of horizontally, it, can, it has to be inside of the rectangle 
for this function to return true. But obviously, we need to handle the vertical cases because horizontal detection isn't enough, obviously. So we use another ambersand, two set of ambersands, and then we say y greater than rect dot y, and then this is the same principle, only for the top edge, and then we need to detect that it's less than the bottom edge as well. So we say if y is less than rect dot y plus rect dot height, again, it's the same sort of principle. And what we'll need to do actually, we will declare some global variables before we continue any further and then we'll use them immediately after so we'll say game variables we'll say let control player equals false because this will be set to true when the user clicks on the red rectangle so then they can actually control the player around but they won't be able to do it just because the document's loaded and then the other one what, what that will create will say let has game started. Whoop. And then that will also be set to false because obviously the game hasn't started yet because it starts when they actually click on the rectangle. So I'll scroll down so I can add some event listeners. So I'll say canvas because we're adding it on the canvas. Dot add event listener and it will be a mouse down event. So not a mouse click event because we want this callback to be activated regardless of whether the user is dragging or whether they're clicking or anything like that. And then we will say get x and y coordinate in relation to canvas. So we have this event argument here and we can get the x and y values of the cursor from this event object. However, we want it in relation to the canvas because we are interacting with elements in the canvas so we will create an object called pos short for position we'll say e dot client and then we'll say minus canvas dot offset left so get the x position of the cursor when this event callback was activated and then minus that by the distance from the left of the document that the left edge of the canvas is. So now this value will be adjusted in relation to the canvas essentially. And then we'll do the same for the vertical. So we'll set e.client y minus canvas dot offset top. And then below this we will create a comment. We'll say C if whoops, see if they clicked on the red square in particular and then we'll say if is cursor in rect and then pause.x pause.y and then player rect so here will be the x and y coordinates and then the player rectangle remember the object there and then this is that function that we just created and so if it does return true then we will open up curly braces and then we will say set has game started we'll set that to true and we'll also set control player to be true as well to actually move the player around we will create a mouse move event listener but before we do this we'll actually need to create another global variable so write a new comment we'll say just to, to prevent game from working while the page reloads and then we'll say let has game over the importance of this will become more clear later on but we'll just create it for now because it is actually used in the following event listener so we'll say canvas dot event listener we'll say add event listener mouse move so whenever the mouse moves and then we'll open up the callback like so with the event argument and then we'll say if control player is true and has game over is false because obviously we don't want to move the rectangle when the game is over so we will say we'll copy this actually because we need to get the x and y coordinates in relation to the canvas but it will be used for different purposes it will be used to actually control the red rectangle 
So we'll set the player x, player x dot x value. We'll say pos dot x minus twenty five minus twenty five because if you remember the player x dot x was fifty and twenty five is half of fifty. So basically, it will be centered. The square will be centered in the cursor. And then we'll say player rec dot y again. We'll do the same. Pos dot y minus twenty five. Same value because it's a square. And then one final thing, we'll say canvas dot add event listener. Final event listener added to the canvas. We'll say mouse up. This one doesn't need access to the event argument. All we'll say then is control player equals false. So they will no longer be able to move round the red rectangle because it's now set to false. So now go back to live server. Again, it won't work. We click anywhere else on the canvas. It's not going to move anywhere. But we click on this and now we can move it so long as we've held down the mouse click. And then as soon as we release the mouse click, again, it's left where it was before. And as you can see, if we click on the edge, yeah, it centers. We move it around on the center. Now this is good. Obviously, nothing else is working, but we will continue with our JavaScript. So we want to be able to detect when the user, when this red rectangle is hitting this black border here, because if it does, then we want to end the game. So we will go back up and below this, we'll create a new function. We'll say, well, actually, we'll create the comment first. We'll say detect whether player makes contact with border and then we'll say function player collision detection like so open that up and then we'll say if and actually this will be on a new line because it's quite a long if statement player player rect dot x plus player rect dot width if that is greater than five 50, 550 because remember the canvas in total is 600 and the border has 50 pixels width all around. So if the right edge of the rectangle is touching the left edge of the black border, then this if condition will be met. And then we'll do the same for the left edge of the rectangle. And then we'll do the same for the y axis. So player rec dot y plus player rect dot height is greater than 550 and then we'll say player rect dot y is less than 50 like so and then these double pipes they're all so if any of these conditions are met then we'll call a game over yeah so we'll call a game over method this game over method hasn't been created but we're going to create it shortly but we will actually call this player collision detection method what we'll to call it in the update method. So it gets called on every render frame of the animation. As for the game over function, we will create that. But actually we will create another global variable. We'll say let start date equals null for now. This is the final global variable. This start date variable will hold a date value. And we only want it to get initialized though, not on document load, but when the game actually starts. So to detect when the game starts, we will go all the way down to our mouse down event listener. And inside this if statement, we'll create another if statement. It will say start timer in a comment. And then we'll say if has game started because it get, has game started, gets set to true just below. So this if condition will only be met once. And then set start date equals new date. So now when we calculate the time difference, it will be based off of when the user actually started the game and not when the user loaded the document. And then we'll actually need to create the game over function. So I'll we'll say function game over at the start. And then we say if has game over, then we'll need to 
set the game over but there's more logic than just changing the, bo the boolean we need to declare let end date so capture the date when this if condition was met and then we say let time difference it's the difference between the end date and the start date equals end date the bigger value minus start date because otherwise if we do it the other way around we won't get the time difference we'll just get a negative number and then we say if time difference less than 60,000 this is because the time difference will be given in milliseconds and one minute is the same as 60,000 milliseconds because remember there's a thousand milliseconds that makes up a second and obviously 60 seconds a minute I'm sure you know obviously and then alert we will so if it's less than a minute then we can say seconds so we'll say you survive time diff divided by a thousand seconds so how many seconds were in the time diff milliseconds and then that will be the correct calculation for the seconds and then after this we will say has game over because it's over now and then we would just refresh the page and then we do that by using the location API which is built in JavaScript dot reload however Obviously, it's unlikely, but I guess we will need to cover the scenario. If they survived for more than a minute or more than 60,000 milliseconds, then obviously this won't be right. Well, I mean, it will be, but it'd just be a bit weird if we said you survived 95 seconds or something like that. So we will need to actually convert the milliseconds into minutes. So 1.5 seconds, something like that. So we will say above this game over function, we'll say function milliseconds to minute. And then it will have an argument of millis to represent the milliseconds. And then we'll say let minute equals math dot floor. So this will round down no matter what. And then we'll say millis divided by 60,000. So work out the number of minutes inside the millisecond. Now we've worked out the minutes, we'll need to work out the seconds. So we'll say let seconds equals, we'll use double parentheses for this, and then we'll use the modulus operator. So we'll say millis modulus 60,000. So the reason why we use the modulus, which stands for the remainder, so if millis is 60,000 or 120,000 or 180,000, then millis would be zero. So this is what you want, obviously, because if it's a full minute, then we want it to be on the minute. So, so we want it to be 1.00 or 2.00 or 3.00. However, if it's not, then we want it to be, you know, like one, two, three, four. We want, the, the, that's what we want the seconds to be. So if millis is 1,000 or 121,000, then the value will be 1,000. And to get this in seconds, we'll need to divide it by 1,000. The reason why it's 1,000 is because of the remainder and no, none of that goes into 60,000 because it's, um, uh, weird it's some decimal number so not point something so that's the reason why it's 1000 because not not a single value of this goes into 60,000 and again it's same with 35,000 for example or 95,000 if, if it was 95,000 we would get we would still get 35,000 because some of it does go into 60,000 but then there's 35,000 left over so that's see you understand now and then we use, we'll use the two fix method to, just in case a decimal gets returned from this, it's unlikely, but just in case, then we will remove all the decimal places to return an integer as a string. Again, if you didn't understand that expl explanation, because I may not have it explained it very well, then just post in the comments box and I'll try to clarify for you what's going on there. And then what we'll do here is we'll say, minutes plus a colon and then we'll say if seconds is 10 we use an eternity operator here then we will prefix we have a zero prefix 
But if not, then we'll have nothing, and then we'll say seconds here. So if seconds is less than 10, then we want it to say like 0 0.5, 0 0.4, for example. But if seconds is 20, obviously we don't want 0 2, 0. We just want 20. So the reason that's the reason why we use the zero prefix, just to format things correctly. And then now we will need to use this method if time diff is more than 60,000, so if it's more than one minute, we'll say let minute minutes survive equals millisecond oh whoops milliseconds to minute and then we'll put the time diff into there and remember the time diff is a milliseconds so it should work out and then we'll say alert we'll use back ticks so we can use tag template literals you survive and then we will have a variable here minute Minute survived. Oh, it spelled it wrong. Whoops. Minute survived. Minute. And then we'll say wow, because I really didn't expect them to survive that long. But just in case, we catch it there. And then now what we'll need to do is we will... So, for example, whoops. So the game ends when the user hits a border like that, but it will also end if the user hits one of these rectangles. And currently there's no way of detecting that. So what we'll do is we will, below this, we'll create a new function. We'll say returns true if two rectangles are colliding. So this function will detect whether or not the two rectangles passed into it as arguments are colliding or not. So we'll say rectangle let is rectangle collision, and then we'll say Rect1, Rect2 is the two arguments, and then we'll say return exclamation mark, because if any of these conditions are true, then they're not colliding, whoops, sorry, but if they are false, then they are colliding, which means we want it to return true, because it will return true if they are colliding, we'll say Rect1.x is greater than Rect2.x plus rect two dot width or so basically this is if the left edge of the first rectangle is further than the right edge of the right rectangle which means obviously that it's not obviously they're not colliding and then we'll say rect one dot x plus rect one dot width is less than rect two dot x and then this will be if the right edge of the the first rectangle is less than the left edge of the second rectangle. And then we'll say rect dot no sorry rect one dot y is greater than rect two dot y plus rect two dot height. And this will be if top of the first rect is past the bottom of the second rectangle. Again, not colliding. And then the final one is if the bottom of the first rectangle is above the top of the second rectangle. So we'll say rect one dot y plus rect one dot height is less than rect two dot y. And then those are all the conditions. And since the rectangles are stored in array, we'll need to declare a function where we loop through the rectangles array and see if any of them are colliding with the red square which the user is controlling. So we will declare a new comment. We'll say detect whether player makes contact with rectangle. And then we'll say function, function rectangle collision detection. And then we'll say rectangles dot for each rect open up like that, that'll be the iterator. And then inside we will say if is rectangle collision. So that function that we just created that returns a boolean. And then we'll pass in player rect and then the individual rectangle that's being looped through. And then so if it does return true, then there's a collision. We'll call it we'll call game over then. 
and then now what what we'll call this rectangle collision section inside the update so it's called each frame of the canvas re-render and then we'll actually put the comments in when we call it just so we can make things clear and then above the player collision detection we will copy and paste his comments here and then so now we go to application we should be able to see that yeah so when we interact with so when we collide with either one of these and the game ends it doesn't matter which one the game will end So what we need to do now is, obviously we need to get them to start moving the rectangles. So all I we'll do for this is we'll just create a function. And again, things are getting kind of crowded now, so comments are very important. So we'll say get the blue rectangle to start moving. So function move move rectangle move rectangles dot for each and then rect and then we'll open it up and then we'll just say rec dot oh whoops rec dot x plus plus equals rec dot d dx so remember at the very start we we gave each of the rectangle objects inside the rectangles array this dx property and then we'll do the same for y rec dot dy so we'll just continually add whatever its iterator value is to its x and y to get it to start moving and we only the problem with this is we only want them to start moving if when the game started so inside the update we'll say if has game started and then we will call the move rectangle but obviously we'll copy the comment first and then now we go back and then as you see but yeah so the problem with this is yeah so it's working they are moving but they only move and the collision section should also be working as well but they only start moving when but yeah there's the collision section for the rectangles so we need to give them some collision section so we will below this move rectangle we'll say detect where the rectangles hit edge of canvas and then I'll say function border rectangle collision detection like so it's quite a long method and then I'll say rectangles the problem is there's a lot of functions with similar sounding names so we need to individuate them out a bit to distinguish them from each other and then we will loop through the rectangles away again and I'll say if rect dot x plus rect dot width greater than canvas dot width or rect dot x is less than zero so if they've collided with the border on the left and right side, if their left and right edges have collided with any of those, then we will need to deflect it on the horizontal on the yeah horizontal axis to send them in, in, in the opposite way. At the same speed that they were traveling, just in this in the opposite direction, which is why we times it by minus one. And this will work for minus numbers as well, because remember a minus by times a minus is a positive, and then times a positive by minus one, it'll go back to minus, and then it'll just keep on alter alternating cycles. And then just to change, just to speed things up, for the other if statement, we'll change x to y, and then we'll say dot height, canvas dot height, because again, it's kind of the same. We'll just change the values. And then we'll do the same here as well, except it's dy instead of dx, and remember this will work because of this here because they're still being incremented by the values of dx and dy but now they've changed so we will again we will call this inside of the update put all the collision section in one place so we'll play border rectangle collision section like so and then now hopefully yeah so okay it's working now as you can see we're getting them oops we're getting them to well, we can actually play the game now, basically. I mean, this is the game. But the problem is they don't speed up. So it's kind of easy-ish. Well, not easy-ish, but it's... 
Yeah, I mean, I guess it is kind of easy to some degree because look, they're not just they're just going around the same place again. They're not speeding up, and we want it to speed. We want it to speed up so the game gets actually harder. Um, yeah, so I'm just playing the game. <laughs> so what we'll say is somewhere around here, we will say speed speed up game. And then we'll say let number of speed equals zero. And then I'm going to create a function configure rect speed. And then this will be, we'll say const speed up game equals set interval. We use a set interval because every time this speed up game is called, we want it to speed the game up. First, we'll increment number of speed because we only want the game to be sped up to a certain extent because if it keeps on being sped up, then eventually it will just get to a point where it's just impossible to play. It'll become humanly impossible and we don't want that. We want to reward skill or not. Yeah, we want, we want it to be possible but hard, basically. Uh, so we'll loop through the rectangle so we can speed up each one. And then we'll say rec.dx. We use the turning operator. We'll say if it's greater than or equal to zero, then rec.dx. We will add 1 to it to make it faster. But if it's not, then we need to add minus 1 to it. So we add in the relevant speed in relation to the direction that it's going. So whether it's going in right or left, we will speed it up in that direction rather than just change its direction. And then we'll do the same for this. Again, we'll copy just for save time. Hold down the Alt key so we can change those like that. Select them and then change them. And then we'll say if number of speed equals to four then we'll say clear interval speed up game so it now it no longer calls anymore and then we will the set interval we'll call it every ten thousand seconds so milliseconds so every ten seconds basically and then obviously we need to call this so yeah so in this if condition that only gets met once We'll say configure rec speed because otherwise it will start counting down on document load, which obviously we don't want. We only want it to start counting down when the game actually starts. So now we can play, and after 10 seconds, you should be able to see them getting faster. Um, are they getting faster now? Oh yeah. So, <coughs> the, so the problem here was we are we need to subtract one instead of yeah. So we're subtracting one because it's a minus number. Yes, yeah, so we oh yeah, so I know what the problem yes, yeah, so if we subtract a minus number then obviously we add it. So that's the reason for that. But now it should be working. Now it should actually be visibly speeding up when every hundred seconds and then the game just gets progressively harder after that. So I'm gonna actually try to the best of my ability now. I do need to concentrate. Uh, but I will if you want to see the completed code for this. And you can you and you want to modify it yourself without having to do it all yourself. Then the code pen link will be in, in the description. As you can, oh yeah, twenty four seconds. See, that's the reason why it's very unlikely that they make it past to sixty or even hot or even thirty seconds. But yeah, like I said before, code pen. I'll post a link to this code pen project in the description for you to look at and modify and copy. You can do what you want to it. And I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. I hope you benefited from it. And peace out.